know, we're all getting older, right? And so what we didn't know is that we're adding a milligram of iron to our frame every day. So get out your calculator, put your age in, multiply it times 365, and that's how many milligrams of iron you have in your body. And it's gonna be a big five digit number. It's gonna be somewhere between 20 and 30,000. And women should have 4,000 milligrams of iron and guys should have 5,000. And so I didn't make this up. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna be 69 in a few weeks. And for my 65th birthday, I decided to reward myself with a really important textbook written by uh, Robert Crichton, who's the, I, he's the Dean of Iron Biology in the, in, the, in the world, actually. So I found his phone number and I called him up and he actually answered. And I said, Dr. Crichton, I just wanna thank you for your you know, decades of research. I said, I want you to help me celebrate my birthday. He said, how can I do that? I said, I'd love a signed copy of your textbook. He said, great, I can do that. So I got this textbook that's used in medical school and and he said, before we parted company, he said, now Morley, I wanna make sure you understand one thing. I said, what's that? He said, you do know that we add one milligram of iron every day we're on the planet. I said, of course I do, because I've read your research. He said, okay, I just wanna make sure you understood. It's that basic. And iron is not your friend. It really isn't. It's a very important mineral, but 80% of the iron in our body has one job. It's a waiter carrying oxygen. 70% is in your blood, 10% is in your muscle. And it's a dumb waiter carrying oxygen. That's all it's doing. And who's the chef turning that oxygen into energy? And it's copper. Copper is the chef inside the mitochondria and we're supposed to find out how many mitochondria we have, right? So Janice thinks we need to know that. So we have 40 quadrillion mitochondria in our body in 100 trillion cells. So that's about 500 mitochondria per cell. So go back to your high school biology text. And you remember that there was a, a cell that had one mitochondria, right? Maybe two. No, it's an incredible network of mitochondria that surround the nucleus providing energy. And what's the nucleus? It's a Xerox machine in the corner and what happens if you unplug the Xerox machine? It doesn't work. Do you think maybe that's where gene mutations are coming from? Low energy? And in fact, that's the truth. One of the most important aspects of gene function is transcription. And guess who powers transcription? Copper, ding, ding, ding. And that's not taught anywhere. Okay. Problem is we don't know what the problem is. We really don't because we still have this belief that there's a very dangerous world out there. But we're gonna talk about what the real problem is. And the biggest problem is we don't know what we don't know. I've talked to a lot of doctors over the years, more recently as, as a, a mineral guy, and there's a, th a phrase that they use that at first I was intrigued by, but then I was unnerved by. I went to business school. All right? when, I couldn't, when I couldn't get into doctor school, I, I was only rejected by 18 medical schools. <laughs> 12 in one day. That was, that was a low day. That was a, it was a nadir for me. Then I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into business because if you can't be a doctor, you're going to go into hospital management to boss them around, right? That's what... So it's, that's the recovery. And so when you go to business school, what gets measured gets managed. That's what drives business school. Revenue, expense, profit. Let's measure it, let's stay on top of it, and let's optimize it. But that's not, how, that's not what drives medicine. Not known because not looked for. And the, and the corollary to that is, I know what to look for, I look for what I know. Have you heard that? That's, that's a centerpiece of medicine. They're taught exactly what to look for. And my daughter-in-law uh, told me that in the first day of medical school at University of Loyola here locally, <clears throat> they said, if we teach it to you, 
it's important. If we don't teach it to you, it's not important. And that's what drives their filter to decide what's important or not. If it's not in the classroom, then I shouldn't learn it. The graduating class, we now live in Chapel Hill, the graduating class, UNC Medical School, which is a pretty decent medical school, 2020 graduating class, how many, how many days of, did they spend in medical school learning about nutrition? Zero. 38 minutes. 38 minutes. What can you learn in 38? You can learn what a potato is and a carrot. It's like, oh my gosh. So this is copper's gift to planet Earth. We live on a planet with 20% oxygen, and it's a poison. The air we breathe in our lungs, that gets to the lung, it's 19% oxygen. It's not your friend. It's, a very, it's the second most reactive element on planet Earth after fluoride. Highly reactive. Copper runs cytochrome C oxidase, known as COX, and it's what activates oxygen, turns it into water to release ADP so it can become ATP. The mitochondria are water wheels. That's really what they are. They're creating water. They're supposed to create water. The second most important enzyme on planet Earth, ferrooxidase, known as FOX. And it's what turns the reactive form of iron, ferrous iron, plus two, into plus three, ferric iron, which can be bound to proteins like transferrin or ferritin. What most people don't, you know, Robert Scott Bell did a really nice job giving an overview of copper. I was really, I was like, wow, he, he really gets it. But he was talking about the cytokine storm, for those of you who were in that room. And he talked about a category six storm. What feeds the Category 6 storm is serum ferritin, which is not supposed to be in our blood, despite what doctors are trained. There's not supposed to. I asked Douglas Kell, world-renowned iron biologist, so you got Robert Crichton, Douglas Kell would be number two. And I said, so how much ferritin should we have in our blood? And you got a picture, he's, he's my age, sitting in front of this wall of books. He's at the University of Manchester. Recently knighted, and I'm like, I'm like, I can't, I'm like pinching myself. He's really talking to me. And I said, Dr. Dr. Bell, Dr. Kell, excuse me, how much, what's the ideal ferritin for a human being? He said, zero. I said, excuse me? He said, well, I want to make sure you understand this. He said, rising ferritin in the serum is not a sign of iron vitality. It's a sign of clinical pathology. The liver or the kidney or both are breaking down and they can't recycle iron properly. And the iron gets dumped into the lysosome, which is the stomach of the cell. 10 amino acids get cleaved off the ferritin and then it gets secreted into the bloodstream. And doctors, doctors are taught, Oh, you want to get your ferritin up to 100 to make your thyroid medication work? Like, oh my God. So let's poison the body so we can make our thyroid medication work? It just makes no sense at all. Superoxide dismutase, very important. When we're inside the mitochondria, complex one, complex three, they easily release superoxide. What is superoxide? It's an oxygen molecule with an extra electron and it's got a really funky attitude about it. So we shouldn't call it superoxide. We have hyperactive kids, right? They're not superactive, are they? They're hyperactive. Well, superoxide is really hyperactive oxygen. It's very reactive. And when it reacts with this iron thingy, that's when you get all sorts of problems. Hydroxyl radicals, hydrogen peroxide, all sorts of really bad reactions. And then this is always a surprise. This is a very important enzyme, dopamine beta monooxygenase. You guys all know that, right? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's an essential enzyme, and I know I'm not supposed to go past this line, right? Um, 
But that, that enzyme turns dopamine into noradrenaline. Why is noradrenaline important? Because it what, it's what allows us to respond to inflammation. What my clients in Louisiana call, hey doc, I got some of that inflammation. Like, <laughs> okay, it's not a disease. As soon as the, as soon as the mitochondria can't turn water, can't turn oxygen into water, the, the complex four is a two cycle engine. First stroke down turns oxygen into hydrogen peroxide. That's another way of spelling inflammation. And then the second stroke is turning hydrogen peroxide into two molecules of water. Both of those strokes require copper. You can't do either stroke without copper. And so when someone has inflammation, means they've got a lot of hydrogen peroxide, which means they don't have copper dependent enzymes, glutathione peroxidase or catalase, neutralizing it. And then that hydrogen peroxide is going to mix with the iron, and you're going to have a big problem. So those are the real gifts to planet Earth, but those are only four of the hundreds of enzymes that copper is responsible for. But these would be the four, probably four most important. I think they're the four most important enzymes on planet Earth. Because we're dealing with two of the most toxic elements, oxygen and iron. So we've been trained to fear the enemies. That's what last year was all about. It was a, it was a re inoculation of past year. People had gotten kind of lazy and they weren't fearful of the the pathogens, right? So let's re-inoculate them. And that's what, that's what Fauci's job was. Get people really anxious about it. And then the coup d'etat, this is, this is priceless. How many people took the COVID cocktail last year? Vitamin D, zinc, ascorbic acid? A few people, okay. The fastest way to destroy the bioavailability of copper is to take ascorbic acid zinc, and vitamin D. And I can wear you out with the research that I've got to prove that. And people think I'm that shit crazy when I say that. Like, you, 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 no vitamin D? Isn't ascorbic acid? All three of them are poison to copper metabolism. Anybody feeling queasy right now? <laughs> OK, so that's the conventional view of the problem. We're back to, to Pasteur and Beauchamp, particle field. And this is our understanding of the energy crisis, like zero, because we've been preoccupied with this. This 2020 was all about this. We're still dealing with it. How many of you have read um, 1984? Okay, okay. So you might want to go back and reread it. So 1948 was when it was published. So you got to do the math. So 1948 from 1984 is 36 years. When you add 36 to 1984, what do you get? 2020. Oh my gosh, it's the activation of the, of the book. And that's what, that's what they're trying to do is instill the totalitarian state worldwide now. And it was written in 1948. Wink, wink, get it? They've been planning this for a while. So this is the enlightened view of the problem. We have an energy crisis, a massive worldwide human energy crisis. And we got to stop worrying about the enemies. My phrase now is ignore enemies, ignite energy. What runs the immune system? It's energy. T cells, B cells, macrophages. None of that works without energy. And what happens to T cells? They get aged and they don't work as well. And what do T cells have to do? They've got to communicate. They've got to remember memory T cells, right? They've got to have a good memory. If you don't have energy, you don't have a memory. That's what Alzheimer's is. It's an energy crisis. That's all it is. So this is where we get into trouble 
is we know what we know. But it's what we know that gets us into trouble. So if you remember nothing else of, from this presentation, please remember this picture. This is it in a nutshell. If you want to memorize this, then you can leave and you will understand it. So Dr. Lopez wrote this article, The Hallmarks of Aging. It's a cornerstone study of aging. And it talks about nine different components of aging. And in the center, you have this perfect representation of life where you've got the fetus and the baby and the toddler and you know, the dad carrying his child. And then, so I'm somewhere between here and here. You know? <laughs> and so they, he really goes to great length to talk about these nine different facets. You know, we've got altered intracellular communication, genomic instability of telomere. Was there any, who was at the dinner last night? It was a really good talk, but, but yeah, but she forgot to say one thing. She was talking about telomeres getting shorter. Well, the woman who got the Nobel Prize in like 2018 or whatever it was for, for the telomeres, she made a very important statement. Telomeres get longer in the presence of copper. So at least she told the truth. But why are they getting shorter? Because people are shorter on copper. So here's the catch. Here's the, here's the whole presentation in a nutshell. As we get older, we lose the ability to absorb copper. Our digestive system gets older. And our, our diet tends to become more sugar focused. We want sweeter things as we get older. We're all guilty of it. But as we get older, iron is rising. One milligram a day. I'm sick, I'll be 69 in a couple weeks. I think my number is like 27,000 milligrams of iron. And so I'm very religious about going to donate blood every quarter. How many people in here are over 50? Okay, we should all be together in the blood center every quarter donating blood. It's the fastest way to feel better. Lower the iron footprint in your body. And what happens when you donate that pint of blood? It's going to come out of the tissue where it's stuck and go back into circulation where it belongs. It's a biological function that doctors aren't taught. And they'll think you're mad if you tell them you're going to donate blood. Because they want to keep that iron in the tissue, keep it stuck, because that's where the oxidative stress builds up. That's where all the problems start. So again, iron is building, copper is falling, and that's a, that's a polite way of saying aging. That's what aging is. And it's the accumulation of iron in the mitochondria. That's what aging really is. And so the focus, this picture of the mitochondria, it's called mitochondrial dysfunction, really should be in the center of the picture. And some of the best research I'm reading about COVID are the studies that are putting the spotlight on COVID is a metabolic crisis in our body. And we're going to talk a little bit about why. It, and we've been trained like circus bears, to be freaked out by this pathogen that we think is a virus, right? When in fact it's a parasite. Has anyone wondered why ivermectin works? Yeah, why? Right? Because it's a parasite that it's killing. And what does a parasite do? It creates viral excrement. The whole thing is a head fake. Quercetin, hydroxychloroquine, and ivermectin. Those are the three solutions to COVID. Quercetin requires an enzyme called quercetin oxidase. Guess what? It's copper dependent. 
So you've taken the co cocktail, it's not gonna work in your body. Hydroxychloroquine, how did they make hydroxychloroquine? In, in 1891, Paul Ehrlich, famous physician in Germany, Nobel laureate, he cured two people of malaria, cured, you could say the word back then, he cured two people of malaria using methylene blue, 1891. It's a big deal. You don't know what methylene blue is. I think it's, it's copper polish that, that you can use inside the body. And so what happened, Big Pharma, BASF, found out about the fact that he did this, said, no, 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 we've got to make it better. We're going to improve, we're going to improve methylene blue, and we're going to turn it into hydroxychloroquine. And now people in India who get malaria are given hydroxychloroquine for the rest of their life. So you can treat the symptom with hydroxychloroquine, or you can solve the problem with methylene blue. Well, there's no money in healthy humans, right? So now we know where the, where the, uh, the profit motive is. But COVID is total head fake to get us back into fearing enemies. But what's it done? It splits society now. Because we're fighting with each other. It's just incredible. So <clears throat> focal point of metabolic dysfunction. Here's the cell. Mitochondria. So we're, we're trained to believe in mitochondrial DNA breaking down, right? We know that. That's where the problem is. Well, it's actually the nuclear DNA we're supposed to be worried about, when in fact, 99% of the DNA in our body is in fact nuclear. Only 1% is mitochondrial. The guy who figured this out, his name is Douglas Wallace, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. Signature article, 2005. It'll blow your mind what he knows about energy deficiency driving all disease on planet Earth. Everything is from energy deficiency. So the reason why I came up with this title, Cure, besides my an unending wit, Cure Your Fatigue, is that if you could get over the fatigue, then you'd get over your symptoms. Because all symptoms start with fatigue. But here's the catch. There's 16 times more oxidative stress in the mitochondrial DNA than there is in the nuclear DNA. That's not taught in doctor school. So you don't need to worry about the nuclear side. <clears throat> Douglas Kell and uh, one of his colleagues, Ethericia Pretorius, she's down in South Africa. They write a lot of really interesting articles. And this particular one is talking about iron dysregulation and dormant microbes. They get stuck. Almost all chronic infectious disease, diseases do in fact harbor a microbial component. And what I discovered about six months ago, came across a um, it was a patent application. I don't know if you've ever read a patent application. They're exceedingly dull, but they're like a, it, it, you have to tell the truth in a patent application. And this, was a, this particular patent application was for a drug to treat, not cure, treat multiple sclerosis. And they were using T4, thyroid medication, and this particular drug to treat MS, and in the, in the narration of explaining why they were doing this, they said it would be good for people to know that all forms of autoimmune, there are about 100 of them now, all forms of autoimmune are caused by parasites that live on iron and feed off of copper. That's a good thing to know. That changes the ball game. So whether you have Renault syndrome, multiple sclerosis, um, lupus, name the, name the autoimmune condition. There's a parasite that created the chaos feeding on dysregulated iron. And why is the iron dysregulated? Because you don't have no copper. Because you weren't born with enough copper. 
So everyone in the room is an adult, I assume. Whether you behave like one or not, you are an adult. But on average, we have about seven milligrams of copper in our liver. When we were each born, assuming we were born to a healthy mom, we had 70 milligrams of copper in our liver. And this is true of all mammals. All mammals have a massive download of copper in the last trimester. Last 12 weeks, most important part. So anybody who was born premature, uh oh, you didn't get the download. I was just talking to someone this morning about that. So the thing is, that download is really important. Here's the catch. 70 milligrams of copper. How much, how much iron is the baby born with? Zero. Zero iron in the brain. And what you don't know is that the, the pregnant woman has three different multi-copper oxidases running her body to manage copper and iron. Ceruloplasmin, Hephaestin, and Zyclopen. And what should really unnerve you is that I know that and your doctor doesn't. Especially if you have an obstetrician taking care of you. They've never heard of Zyclopen or Harry McArdle in, in Scotland, who's a genius about the copper iron transfer in the pregnant woman that's not taught in doctor school. Not that I feel passionate about it at all. <laughs> so this is just a very busy diagram from this article by Dr. Kell. But here's the disease process, but where it starts is iron dysregulation. In this article, the, the one, this is from 2014, but his, his signature article is 2009. It's called Iron Behaving Badly. Anybody want to guess how many footnotes are in that article? Iron Behaving Badly. I should say he's got OCD. That should give you a clue. 2,427 footnotes. So what he was telling the clinical and scientific community is you're not just wrong about iron, you're dead wrong. And I asked him, I said, how is it you get to say this? He said, well, more or less, let's just say I have a benefactor that really enjoys the truth. And I have an endowed chair, and I can say whatever I want as long as it's the truth. You won't find that in many endowed chairs in most research facilities. And so what he's talking about here, Alzheimer's, Lou Gehrig's disease, atherosclerosis, type 2 diabetes, Friedrich's ataxia, oxidative DNA damage, booga booga DNA damage, Parkinson's, preeclampsia, rheumatoid arthritis, stroke, all of it, and all of the other symptoms in the Merck manual, 100% of them, are from iron dysregulation. Dr. Nakamura, talking about iron homeostasis and reactive oxygen species in cell death. Iron overload damages cells and causes harmful effects on the body through oxidative stress. There's a penetrating look into the obvious. And so whenever we have stress in our world, anybody have stress in their world? No stress, right? We're all, we're all chill. As soon as you have stress in your world, you have oxidative stress in your body. And what's the first thing that happens? Your cells become hypoxic. What does hypoxy mean? Does anybody know what hypoxy means? No oxygen, right? We've been trained like circus bears. No oxygen. No, we're not on Mount Everest. Hypoxia means not enough copper to metabolize oxygen. That's what hypoxia really means. It's called functional hypoxia. I've read 8,000 articles. How many of them actually said that? One. One article in 8,000 talked about functional hypoxia. When in fact, that's what's driving our physiology right now because you're stressing out about what I'm saying. 
You're freaking out about it. And your brain cells are fritzing out right now. Because you're like, well, but they don't talk about that on the internet. <laughs> Dr. Google, right. And again, this is just a very stylized version of explaining the process of oxidation. What's in green is where copper comes to save us. Again, th this is an article by Dr. Nakamura from 2019. And this is who saves us day in and day out. Ceruloplasmin. Well, let's say it. Ceruloplasmin. Ceruloplasmin. How many times have you said that word in school? A lot. A lot? OK, all right. <laughs> all right. Um, discovered in 1948 by two Swedish physiologists, Holmberg and Laurel, they thought they had discovered the Holy Grail. And Big, big Pharma has been demonizing it ever since. 1948, it, it, it has eight copper atoms to run it. And in, in the literature, the, in, the, in the very hoity-toity literature uh, from 1948 to about 1970, it was eight copper atoms. In 1970 to about 2000, it dropped down to seven. Suddenly it was seven atoms of copper. And then past 2000, it's dropped down to six. Where are these coppers going? Anybody know? I ask, I talk to copper researchers all the time. I say, where'd, that, where'd the copper go? Don't know. Just, it's just disappeared from the human being. Just for clarification, could you repeat what you just said about that decline? Is that occurring in the human body over a period of time? Absolutely. Okay. It's, a, it's occurring in the four-legged rats, oh, rats and the two-legged rats. Okay. We're the two-legged rats. I didn't absorb the numbers you just That's said. That's okay. So we start, with, we start with eight. It's a V8. It's supposed to be a V8. Does anybody have a V8? What happens if you go down to a V6? It doesn't work the same, does it? So we're supposed to have a V8 running ceruloplasm. Then it became a V7. Then it's now it's a V6. That should, that should make the hairs on the back of your neck tighten up a little bit. And so, but this protein, 1,066 amino acids, one of the most complicated proteins in the human body, and it carries an additional 10 to 15 copper atoms. Why, why would Mother Nature build a protein that has all that copper, what do you think it's doing? It turns out in 1985, a guy by the name of Earl Frieden, he was the iron biologist before Robert Crichton. He was at uh, Florida State University. He said, well, you know, I think ceruloplasm is delivering copper to the mitochondria. Oh my God, the blowback he got, big time. It's like, what are you talking about, Dr. Frieden? It couldn't possibly be like that. 2017, 2019, two preeminent groups said Frieden was right. Ceruloplasm feeds our mitochondria. So if you don't have good ceruloplasm, guess what? You don't have good mitochondria. You don't have good melatonin. You don't have good energy. It's all related. And this is just more of the same, just different pathways for cell death. But what I want to point out here these are you know, apoptosis and ferroptosis, and these are just different ways of killing the cell. Don't you, what I'm amazed by is the number of studies that I've read that talks about how we can kill the cell. How many studies do you think I've read where they're talking about how can we optimize cellular function in humans? How many have I read? Zero. Not one study in 11 years. How do we optimize human physiology? Every one of them is how can we kill it? And so what's important here is each of these diagrams is talking about labile iron. L. Ron Hubbard has a famous saying, never go past a word you don't know the, the meaning of. So I ignored it for two years because I thought label meant happy. It's, it's, it's comfortable. Everything's chill. Until I looked it up, oh my gosh, labile means reactive, destructive. It's really bad. The fastest way to, to weaken our metabolism is to have a buildup of labile iron, not just in the cell, because that's where they like to picture it, 
Where do you think the labile iron ends up? In the mitochondria, of course, because that's where iron gets recycled. And what happens when you have too much iron in the mitochondria? Oh, I can't and so there's, there's models for destroying mitochondrial function using 40% iron concentration, 60% iron concentration, 80% iron concentration, and 96% iron concentration. They've, they've really got the real stat down. They know exactly how much they need in order to power us down. What do you think 2020 was all about? And what happens when you, when you can't think? You go into a state of fear. You go reptilian. So the reptiles out there turned us into reptiles. So this is just more of the same. However, excessive levels of reactive oxygen species promote vascular disease through direct and irreversible, irreversible oxidative damage to macromolecules, as well as disruption of redox-dependent vascular wall signaling processes. Atherosclerosis, it's the number one cause of death on planet Earth. It's an energy deficiency. Cancer, the number two cause of death. There's no disease called cancer. It's called cancer metabolism. And you know who understood that better than anyone on the planet? A guy named Otto Warburg. He knew exactly what caused cancer. Do you know he was nominated for a Nobel Prize 47 times? He got one. Do you know why he only got one Nobel Prize? Because Hitler said one was enough. Why did Hitler care about how many Nobel Prizes Otto Warburg got? because he was a German Jew, just like Hans Krebs. And why did he keep Otto Warburg around? Because he knew that Otto Warburg knew how to cure cancer, and Hitler's mother died of cancer. And he didn't want to die of cancer, so he kept him on. And there's actually a report where the SS came to get Otto Warburg, took him into prison, and Hitler wrote a personal note and said, release this man. So Warburg knew what it was about. Warburg was studying oxygen respiration of fish larvae in the 1920s. Fish larvae, oxygen consumption. And what's really funny is he gets the Nobel Prize for the respiratory enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase. It's complex four. And here's the head fake. He called it iron oxidase. Yeah, there's iron in there, but copper's doing all the work. And that threw off 90 years of research because people kept focusing on iron, not thinking that copper was there. And what's good to know is that Otto Warburg's cousin was a guy named Paul Warburg, who started the Federal Reserve System. It's all about who you know, right? And so vascular disease, number one cause of death, has nothing to do with these, all these conditions, diabetes, high cholesterol, aging, smoking, and high blood pressure, all caused by the body's inability to metabolize those conditions because there's not enough bioavailable copper to spit at. Iron overload alters the energy metabolism in patients with MDS, myelodysplastic syndromes. MDS. <clears throat> another, another way to describe MDS is called copper deficiency myelopathy. It's a copper issue. And this is this has troubled clinicians for decades. And the guy who understands this better than anyone on the planet, his name is Dr. Kumar, K-U-M-A-R, at Mayo Clinic. He's written eight articles about this. It's all copper. MDS mononuclear cells display an altered energy metabolism associated with increased oxidative stress due to iron accumulation. And these are some fascinating uh, 
statistics from his study where we've got a control. Someone's, these are people 8 to 20 years old. Another control, 21 to 60 years old. Another control group, 61 to 86 years old. And then people with MDS, 57 to 86 years of age. And what we're measuring here is MDA, Milan dialdehyde. So I've got, what, two more hours? Yeah, just about. OK. Lack of copper. Lack of copper, as we get older, causes an increase in oxidative stress. And that MDA is given off in lipid peroxidation. What is lipid peroxidation? It's when the membrane gets rusty. Why is the membrane getting rusty? Because there's too much iron. It's not being regulated properly. And so what is MDS? It's aging on steroids. Here we're looking at LDH, lactate dehydrogenase, going up. And when we're using up more lactate, it means we have less pyruvate to go into the Krebs cycle. Pyruvate is our friend. And this is energy production, ATP. Again, control, 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 MDS. It's very simple. You want to feel better? Make more energy. Ignore the enemies, ignite the energy. It's a disease of energy deficiency. And it's, it's really what's driving COVID. So real quick, what I want to share with you before we have to, before, what, is, what is your name? I didn't catch that. Jody? Jody? Cody. Cody. Before Cody kicks us out of here, um, let, me, let me share this with you real quick. Every second of every day, every second, we need to make two and a half million red blood cells. Every second. We've been together now for 40 minutes times 60. Some big numbers start to pop up. And there's a process that they go through to mature. Any function in the human body that requires maturity requires bioavailable copper. There's not one thing in the body that doesn't require copper that requires maturation. Everything that has maturation behind it. But what I discovered in this article by Thomas Gans, he's a big uh, researcher at uh, WashU in St. Louis, is that there is a split that takes place when the body's in the process of deciding, what are we going to do? We're, we're inside the bone marrow. Are we going to make bone cells? Or are we going to make blood cells? There's intelligence behind that. We're making bone, we're making blood. What are we going to do? And when you've got high iron in the tissue, you're not going to make red blood cells the way you're supposed to. What's going to happen is, here's the catch. How many people in this room have ever been told you were anemic? That's quite a few. So there's a difference between iron in the blood and iron in the tissue. They're not the same. They're completely different media. And in order for the iron to get into the blood, it's got to get out of the tissue, which means it's got to be recycled. And copper is behind all of that. And so when someone is told that they are, have hypophoremia, low iron in the blood, that's what it, hypo, low, fair, iron, emia, blood, there's a relationship between that and an inflammatory state. Again, we're not making energy. It's, the body's not able to make energy properly. Now here's the catch. Interferon, Terminal necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, these are all going to drive iron into the tissue. Why would the body do that? 
Why would the body's conserved response be if we've got any sense of perception that there's a problem, there's a threat, there's an enemy, why would the body drive iron into the tissue? Keep it away from bacteria. All pathogens. Absolutely. Keep it away from the bacteria and all pathogens. Body's really smart. It knows that pathogens love iron. That's their medium. Anemia of inflammation is primarily a disorder of iron distribution. Thomas Gans actually said that. That's the whole catch. There is no iron deficiency anemia on planet Earth. Good God, the number one element on planet Earth, 36% of the Earth's composition is iron. Up until last year, I, I believe that humans were the most intelligent species on the planet. <laughs> I wonder about that now. But, but what that would mean is if you're anemic, if you're iron deficiency, if you have iron deficiency anemia, you probably learned about that in nutrition school, right? right? But if you have that, that means that the most evolved species on the planet can't metabolize the number one element on planet Earth. Makes no sense. And the reason why it doesn't make sense is because it's anemia of inflammation, which was coined in 1942 by Max Weintraub, who was at Johns Hopkins University, very gifted scientist, and he got kicked out. You know why he got kicked out? He was Jewish. And Hopkins said, get out of here. Can you believe that? So Hitler holds on to, and Hopkins kicked him out. I'm, I'm from Baltimore. I'm embarrassed to know that. My nickname is Baltimorely. And I used to worship at the altar of Hopkins until I found out about that. That's like disgusting to me. But he went on to build the University of Utah Medical School and did 40 years of devoted research around copper. And that was his payback to Hopkins. Max Weintraub, W-I-N-T-R-O-B-E. He will blow your mind with what he knew. Missing information equals missing truth. And the, the key is, if the myeloid cells can't differentiate because there's not enough energy in the system to do that, the whole thing shuts down. And that's where people get caught, is because their, um, their tissue cannot think through the process of getting from one state of red blood cell to the mature state. So it can start to make the progenitor cells, but it cannot make the fully mature RBCs because there's two things that have to happen. You gotta have energy to do it, and you gotta kick iron out at the end. Iron has to go out with the nucleus, with the mitochondria. Iron's gotta be there when that all changes in the red blood cell, and it goes concave, right? And here it is, red blood cells carrying oxygen, makes energy anaerobically. Fascinating. I got oxygen, but I can't make energy with oxygen. So I go anaerobic, anaerobic glycolysis. We've got eight of the 10 enzymes to make energy in anaerobic glycolysis require what? Mineral magnesium, ding, ding, ding. And so that's why we measure magnesium in the red blood cell. Because if your magnesium level is low in the red blood cell, that means you're really stressed out. The most basic function, two and a half million red blood cells a second, the most basic function in the body is stressing because there's too much iron in the body. So I will, I will leave it there. I, I could talk for another two days, but Cody's not going to let me do that. But do you have any questions before we, we part? Yes. I have a, a client who's a friend, keeps getting diagnosed with anemia. She has extremely heavy uh, menstrual flow. I'm wondering if the body is trying to regulate getting rid of that excess iron. The body's really smart. It says the only way to get rid of excess iron in the human body, bleed it out. Bleed it out. It's the only way to get rid of it. Yeah. And so the doctor misunderstands that. They've been trained. Giving her more blood is what they're doing, transfusions. I've got, I've got a, when I first met this individual uh, eight years ago, she had just finished her 100th iron infusion, and she's now a student in my program because she discovered that that was not the answer. Now she's got her life back. Picture 100 infusions of iron. It's a miracle that she's alive. Yeah. So does 
that mean that bloodletting actually was beneficial back in the medieval times? When, when do you think bloodletting stopped? When they ran out of blood? No. <laughs> no. It's, it stopped in the 1500s when the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons was formed in England. We can't have that. We've got to stop that. And for a couple hundred years, it was still being used. But the Royal College of Physicians absolutely expressly prohibited it. But were they deficient in copper back then also? Well, it was, it was different back then. That, you know, um, people used to eat bread. They weren't, they weren't allergic to, to grain, right? They weren't allergic to dairy. There's copper in there. And uh, they were drinking uh, beer and wine that was being made in vessels that had copper. They weren't glass lined like they are today. Everything's glass lined. You didn't know why. It's to keep it away from the copper. So copper can't get into the fluid. I mean, they've, they've figured this out. They've been working at this for a century. COVID is just the cherry on the top. But you didn't know what it stood for. Copper's vanished. Iron's dominant.